Okay, welcome to the Mississippi PowerShell User Group May 2015 meeting. Our guest speaker this month is PowerShell MVP Kurt Munro. He'll be presenting a session on a peek inside the Poshaholics tool belt. And now I'll turn it over to Kirk. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I appreciate you inviting me to this uh, user group as well, because I don't think I've had a chance to present for your uh, user group community before. And so it's always fun to, to reach out to a uh, new bunch of people. Um, just to let everybody in the uh, virtual audience know, um, my presentation style is very casual. Uh, it's never heavily scripted. That means I might make some mistakes, might fumble over my keys on the keyboard, but that's fine. I work through that during the, the talk. Um, it also means that if you guys have any questions at any time, uh, feel free to speak up and, and uh, uh, grab my attention and let me know either in the chat, uh, which I just opened, so hopefully that'll catch the corner of my eye, or uh, if I don't happen to notice the chat, then maybe just ping Mike and see if you can interrupt me, and I'll be happy to deal with those questions as I go through. Um, also, because this is a PowerShell talk, which are my absolute favorite talks to give, uh, I don't have a slide deck because slides are boring, and um, when I when I'm talking about PowerShell, it's typically because I'm showing off what I do and what I like about PowerShell, and so I'm not even going to bother with an intro slide. Uh, I just have here showing me, this is my GitHub page. Um, this is where I work with all of my modules these days uh, in oh, that, is, that are open source. Uh, there are some that I have internal that are not there yet, but uh, all the ones that I'm going to be talking about today are there already. Uh, as well as in the PowerShell gallery, and I'll talk about how that's laid out for those modules and how you can get them and that sort of thing as I go along. Um, and um, I do speak quickly, so um, that's actually another reason why I tend to prefer less scripted demos, because it forces me to pause and think about what I want to say, rather than rambling off something that I've memorized and, and doing a, an hour and a half presentation in 45 minutes, which I've actually done before. Um, so, yeah, so my background, for you guys who haven't met me before, um, I've been doing, I've been working with computers for forever. I, my, my dad bought me a TRS-80, well, about the family TRS-80. I just like to say he bought it for me, but it was the family's uh, back when I was a kid. And uh, we were buying compute magazines at the time, and I was doing one-liners, and they were very, very powerful, which I find is fun and reminiscent of uh, or PowerShell makes me think of that because the power of PowerShell one-liners, although I'm not doing anything goofy like I used to do or creating these little video games, but it's still, it's fun to go back. To, I, I enjoy working at the command line, and I enjoy working with uh, interactive uh, commands and scripts. And I eventually grew up and became a developer and then worked for a bunch of different companies and doing C++ development and C Sharp development. And then I went to a presentation back when Exchange uh, was in the Exchange 12 uh, uh, brand. That would have been Exchange uh, 2012, I think. Is that right? Anyway, it's been a little while for Exchange for me. But back when there was Exchange, no, not 2012, but it would have been before that. Exchange 2007, which I believe was called Exchange 12. That's right. I went to a conference on Microsoft campus, and uh, I saw a demo of this thing called Monad, and it was really cool. And um, cool enough that I wanted to change my career over it. And so when I went back to the office, I knew we already had this product that we were working on inside of Quest called Paragui. And so I reached out to that team and I started interacting with them and, and got myself switched into that group, uh, that product group. And I haven't looked back since. And I've been doing pretty much 100% PowerShell for the past eight years, starting with that point. Um, I've also worked on a bunch of other PowerShell products, worked for Dev Farm on PowerWF, PowerSE. Uh, I'm not working on any PowerShell products in particular these days. I work for a company called Provence Technologies. We do asset management software plugged into uh, System Center Service Manager. And uh, we've, I've been working with them for the past couple of years. We, I do automation inside, of course, uh, Provence, but uh, uh, it's not like a PowerShell focused uh, business like the other ones I have worked for in the past. So um, enough about me. So let's get into the talk and what I want to talk about. So in working with PowerShell, and, and I mean, I'm, I'm as much into PowerShell that um, 
I avoid the command. I avoid the GUI as much as I can, and I revert to doing things in the command line because I can get stuff done much faster. And it, it's actually interesting because I used to have a problem years ago when I was doing software development because I used to be the protocol layer guy, and I used to work on Mappy, and I used to work on LDAP, and and some other low-level protocols. And I used to have this problem where I would switch from one API to another API, and each time I switched that API, or maybe I grab a DLL that somebody else in the company had wrote, and I could adopt that and work with that. And each time I would make those those switches, it would be a context switch, and I'd have to wrap my head around the mental model of the person who was writing those tools. And it's not very easy when you don't have any kind of a standardization or, or, or guidelines on, on how that should be done. There was no consistency. And so that's one of the things that really drew me to PowerShell was the fact that it was really, really consistent, designed in the language from the ground up and uh, as a feature of the language and uh, with rules that you had to follow. And because that consistency and those rules were there, I could make intelligent guesses and, and, be, and be right, and I love that. And so now I find that I get frustrated with GUIs because GUIs aren't necessarily consistent. And I have to figure out the mental model of the person who is designing the GUI in terms of where they put the feature that I want to go and click on that little checkbox or, or do that, that activity with the, with the GUI. And it's just not as, as efficient and it's not as, as um, appealing to me. And so I revert to doing things from the command line whenever possible. So a lot of my days are spent uh, in, in here, in PowerShell ISE, or, or in the native PowerShell console, uh, which I often use just for uh, the raw speed of being able to open it up very quickly and get that stuff uh, faster. And so, so yeah, so, so with that work, I end up creating a lot of modules along the way. And, um, and because I've been tied into the PowerShell community and worked myself into the PowerShell MVP, uh, status eight years ago, I kind of, I, I get in and I tinker and I, I go down these little rabbit holes and I wonder what if, what would happen if I wanted to change this, fix that, do this other thing. And so I do, I do some interesting things that I, a, lot, a lot of other people don't do. And that's the kind of stuff that I want to show you here today. So let's, um, let's get started and show off some of those things. So I create this, I have a, a whole a growing series of modules that all end in PX. Um, so form, you're, you're going to see me talk about format PX, snippet PX, history PX, debug PX, type PX, plus some other ones that I have already published and other ones I have on the way. And um, uh, one of the things I do with this is uh, people ask me sometimes why PX. And I, I use PX because it looks kind of like RX at a glance, and RX is Remedy. Uh, you know, you often see the, that, that logo for a Remedy as, as RX if you're dealing with prescriptions. And a lot of the things I have are, are I feel like, remedies or, or, or prescriptive problems to, uh, or solutions, I should say, prescriptive solutions to problems that run into in PowerShell. So that's where the, the, the suffix comes from, and it just ends up being a bit of consistency and branding for the stuff I create. So one of the modules I want to talk about is, is format PX. And, um, I'm just going to run through a couple commands here, just so you can see where where I started finding inspiration for this module. So, um, first thing I'm going to do is just go and get a bunch of commands from another module. It doesn't really matter which one. This is just just because because when you're dealing with modules, whether you guys are consuming my modules because you've downloaded them from the community or Mike's or anybody else's, you know, you go on to uh, the PowerShell uh, gallery and you, you use PowerShell Get to download somebody's module, or you go into Script Setter and you find something and you download it. And you want to think, you want to see what it has. And not all modules, believe it or not, not all modules are really well documented. That's not a surprise. People do documentation as the last effort most of the time. Um, but documentation is sometimes there and it can be really useful. And so one of the first things I'll do with a module when I download it or if I install a new version of Windows and I want to see what a module does is I'll want to look at the commands in it. And so I just run get command dash module debug PX, which shows me some useful information being the names of those commands and some stuff that might be useful, whether it's a function or a commandlet and stuff I don't care about at all. This, this, um, the fact that it came from the module that I told it to go get the commands for. And so it's sort of useful, but not, use, not, not so much. And so what if I want to go and, and get help information for those because there might be better information in there. And so I can pipe that to get help. And then I see way too much information. I don't want to go through and read all of this stuff. I just want an introduction to the module. It, very often, module authors will create uh, uh, light help information 
uh, do a synopsis and whatnot, but not necessarily provide you with a detailed about file for a module. Maybe they don't have a website for the module. And, and so you want to be able to get at whatever information they have available, but not at this level. You're still working at this new module. You've downloaded it, and you want to glance at what it does. And so I can take get help, and I can grab out of that a few properties. And so this scrolls off my screen here. Let me move it over. I can grab a few properties in GitHub, like the, the name and the synopsis. Those are two good properties for giving me a better idea of what my module uh, uh, has that I'm taking a look at. So I'll run that one, and this is a bit better. Now I can see commands, as well as a very brief description of what they do, the synopsis. So that's useful. I like it. So now let's throw that into a function. So I'm going to create this git module info function. And now I can run that, com that command. Uh, that module, uh, the, sorry, yeah, get module info. I can run the get module info function for any module that I have. I'll do the same one here. But I get back the same results, and that's great. But if you're if you're familiar with PowerShell, um, and I can ask for a raise of hands, but I probably have a mixture in the room of uh, various levels of experience with PowerShell. If you're familiar with PowerShell, you probably know that when you create commands in PowerShell, and you do something like this with the output of that command that that is typically a very strict no-no because of what happens. So in PowerShell, just in case you're not familiar with it, in PowerShell, whenever you're working with uh, a command, it returns you back to objects. Objects have properties and methods. And if you want to see what properties and methods are on those objects, you can pipe to this, this command here on the right-hand side, this, this get member command. So let's say I want to see what I can do with get module info now that I have it. So I'm going to run get module info, and I'm going to pipe it to get member, which will give me some details about what I'm getting back. And in this case, the information I get back is not helpful whatsoever, because I get back five different types of objects, and they're all Microsoft PowerShell commands, internal format, blah, whatever. Format start data, group start, format entry, group end, and a format end. That's because the way that when, you, when you're dealing with PowerShell and you run a command, it with, without doing anything special to it, you just run git service or git process or in this case git module info, it goes and gets a bunch of data and it sends it out to the default output formatting, formatting and output layer in PowerShell. And the default formatting and output layer in PowerShell so the default output will keep it as an object, but if, if you format, if you specifically indicate that you want to format, like I'm doing right here, format table natively in PowerShell will convert. It takes the objects that came in, which are objects that have some inf interesting information on them for my, for my help data, and it converts those into objects that describe how the, how the data should be rendered in the console, so this, these format objects. And that's, that's a dead end. You can't go further than this and then do interesting things, which is why it is a best practice. It's actually an anti-practice, um, or an anti-pattern, I should say, to pipe, to format something inside of any function that you write, because it's the end of the road. It means that anybody who tries to use your command afterwards can't do something with it, because the data's been converted. So that's, that's been a pain point in PowerShell since version 1. And uh, if you talk to the PowerShell team, it's one that they've long wanted to get rid of, but they just never, they never bumped up the priority list high enough. And if you know some details about the internals of the PowerShell formatting code, it's very, very complicated and not pretty to deal with. And that's probably why it hasn't bumped up the priority list high enough to do, because it would be expensive. So, um, so what can you do with that? So I created this module because I wanted to tackle this problem. I, I run into it myself. Lots of people ask me about it. Lots of people run into this issue. And so I'm going to uh, import back where I was. Yeah, so I created this module, uh, import, or sorry, called format px. And so I'm going to import that. And so when I um, import that module, one thing I want to show is, um, yeah, so it, 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 all it does is it, is it imports visibly this format PX module. Behind the, machine, behind the scenes, it also uses another module that I'm going to talk about in a minute called Snippet PX. And Debug PX is only loaded because I'm working with it, because I'm calling git command on that module, which loads the module if it's not loaded. So, so I got my module loaded. And now that's loaded, if I run uh, git module info, 
uh, and I type to get member now, now I actually get back my object data. So, so I can still run, if I go back for a second, I can still run my command to get my format, and it's still, it's still piping to format table, but I can now pipe to get member and do things with those objects. And the reason why is because format PX fixes PowerShell formatting the output. It fixes this issue of the conversion. So instead of converting, what it does is it determines what format you want, and then it takes that format information and attaches it to those objects and lets those objects fall through. And then when, they're, when those objects are going to be output to PowerShell, Format PX steps in again and looks at those objects and checks, do they have any format information on them? If so, show the format. Otherwise, let the objects go to the default format, whatever the default format happens to be. So, so the way that that works is I've got this, um, uh, here, let me store the data first. So I'm going to do that get module info again, store it in a collection, and now I'm going to access this property called format data. So here you can see, uh, actually, I should do that with dot value just so you can see what it looks like. Um, so, um, there. So, every object that you pipe to format something will come out the other side of the format command as the object itself, but it will have this hidden double underscore, double underscore format data property attached to it. And it's hidden because I don't want it to interrupt normal flow and people to muck around with it. It's just format data. It's, I'm just attaching this format information to the object itself. You don't need to worry about it. It's just a default format that the object is going to use. So I hide it, and then I use it internally in the output engine to actually show some formatting. So I've got the format, the format uh, container for the actual entire format, and then groups inside of that, and then entries inside of that. And so that's, that's kind of how I'm doing the magic to, to fix this problem. But I want to point out one thing, too, um, and that is um, when you, if you're going to use this, uh, which it, there's a number of scenarios where it's highly useful. I mean, this is a great example. Here's a function where it goes and gets some data, and you want that data to, to look a certain way. And so what are, you, what are your options? Normally in PowerShell, your options are maybe defining a PS default parameter set, which doesn't give you really nice formatting, but it gives you some formatting. Or maybe using PS1 XML files, and those are, are uh, incredibly complicated for what you actually want to do, because it's an XML data used to define uh, the default table format or list format, and for really, just for formatting, they're very, very complicated, much more than, than I think that they should be. Or you can actually just pipe to format something and take a dependency on this format PX module, and you're good to go. So that's the kind of why I wanted to create this thing, because it just is, I want to solve that problem, the formatting. But one thing I want you to be aware of is that, you know, I'm not going to go and do some ad hoc stuff here for a second just to show you. Uh, no, I can show you this way too. So um, when you pipe to format table or format list or format wide or format custom, and you have format PX loaded and it adds this format data, that is transient. And the reason why it's transient, actually, here's a great example. I'm going to create an error. Oops, one divided by one minus one. So one divided by zero. That's what I'm running here, and it's going to create an error. So there's an error. Now I can go error, zero, and I can see that error. And I can pipe that error to uh, format table, and I can force it. And this, by default, you have to force it. This is another thing that, um, that format PX fixes. It makes it so you don't have to force formats. If you're telling it to format a certain way, it's going to give you the format in that way. So I can do format table or, or format list. But it, that defines what the default format is for that particular object. But then I can still go back to, it, it, and that's only for what it falls into the pipeline. I can still go back to how errors are displayed by default in PowerShell. That's why it's transient, because I'm actually attaching data to objects, and if, in this call up here to format list, I attached it in a way that it was permanent, then when I called error zero down here, then that error would show up with format list uh, as the default format. And so you need to make a decision 
when you're using this module and you want to figure out or you, you need to make a decision, is, it, is this a persistent format that I want to hold on to for this particular set of data? Or is it something that's just transient and I don't care about it? And most often, if you're dealing with using format data in a function, you're going to do this. You're going to add this dash persist when output parameter, which is added by format px to every format command. So what that does, I'll load that version of the command. Now I'll run my module info. Now I can look at it. So there's my default output. I look at it again. I get the same default output because I persisted the format. The format is actually on the records that are stored in module info. If I then pipe that to format list, because I want to look at maybe a list format for the same thing, I can do that. So here's format list, a few properties, names, synopsis, and let's say I want to see description as well. So description is a little bit more complicated, but that doesn't matter. I just want to see some of those fields. So there I get those fields. That's great. But I didn't, because I didn't do dash persist when output here, it was just transient, like how we typically use format list. Then when I come here to the next line and I say module info, I still get the default. So by having this dash persist when output parameter to make it be format information that will stick around. By the way, there is also an alias for that. I can do dash sticky. That'll work as well. Um, um, but anyway, so that by, by, by having that parameter, that allows me to make it so that I'm actually assigning a format that I want to be the default format for the instances of this data without mucking about. All this time, I'm working with help data, right? And I can still do get help uh, or get, um, let me do get command dash module format px type to get help. And so I'm working with the default format on my collection of help objects in module info, but that doesn't do anything to change my default format for help. So it's, it's a really nice scenario because it makes it so that PS1 XML files are still used to define the default help for an object type globally inside a PowerShell. But format commands can be used to define and assign a default format for a small collection of objects. And that's what I'm doing, if that makes any sense. Hopefully that makes sense. So, um, so yeah, you can, you can really do a lot of things. Like here, I'm taking the same module info collection. And because format, I'm changing the entire format layer so that I'm appending format data to objects and then replacing it. Uh, OK, thank you. I'm glad that makes sense. Um, so I can now take that, and I can pipe it to format table, and then to format list, and then to format wide, and then to format custom, and then to this other one, to format default, which I do at the end. And so when I run this, I go, and I, get the default, I end up getting the default format for those objects. Because each time, all I'm doing is replacing the format data collection, or the format data field that is on each of these objects. So I go and get it in a, in a table format. Then in a list format, and I replace the one in the table format. And then in a wide format, I replace that one, and I replace the custom, with the custom one. Then I replace it with, with whatever the default is, which I get from, uh, that's interesting. But anyway, going back to what I was talking about. Yeah, so here I'm, I'm replacing each of the formats. And then this next line, I go and I still have my default because I did that persist when output. So, so it's quite magical in how you can muck around with what you want things to look like, and yet still end users can get the data in the format that they want when they look at it on the screen, and it all just magically works together. And so I'm quite proud of this. It was quite a big feat to, uh, to go through and, and do all this. Now, um, I want to show a few more things about format PX. So uh, let me show you something else here. This is a very, very common pain point. Let me, uh, I'm going to load a function. So show format PX magic. All it does is it gets a service and it gets a process. Now, um, let me just run that function. Now look at this. So if you're familiar with PowerShell, you may all, all, all right off the bat look at this and realize, wait a minute, that's not how things usually happen. Because the way things usually happen is like this. Let me remove format PX so it's not loaded. I'm just going to make sure it's not loaded. Yeah, so it's not loaded. So now let me run that function again. 
So this is what usually happens. If you ever create a command or a script block, it doesn't matter. You just have a, a, a it could be one liner. You have something that you invoke, and as part of that invocation, it returns multiple different object types. Then the moment that PowerShell receives the second and third and fourth object type, it doesn't matter what the default format is for those, it's going to show it to you as a list, which is annoying because it's very limiting and it doesn't allow you to do any kind of uh, uh, reporting functions where you might want to go and get a bunch of different things and just show it on the screen. And so if I go back and reload my module, let me go back, I think I already have it down here. By the way, these, these, um, all these files here that I have, I can share as well um, if you want to see them and think about the stuff afterwards. Um, so I'm going to import my module again, and I'm going to rerun the command. And boom, it just works. And this is the way it's supposed to happen. Because the default format for services is table. The default format for processes is table. Each one of them has their own specific columns, and there's no reason why they shouldn't show one format as a default and another format as a default. Instead of flipping to this, this format list nonsense when it says, oh, I got a different type and I don't know what to do, and it sort of just, just falls apart. And so that's another thing that the format PX module fixes, is this notion of default uh, format. So that's a good uh, overview of format PX. Um, Please tinker with it if you uh, are so inclined, and let me know what you think. I have a bunch of other things I'm working on, because format PX, or format, sorry, formatting, and output in, in PowerShell in general has other problems that I haven't yet solved, and so uh, there are some other things that I'm working on that uh, I'll talk about later. Um, but it's, uh, it's a fun module to work on. It's one of my favorites, and, and so if there's things that you see that, or maybe you have some ideas for stuff you'd like to see, let me know, because I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'd like to spend some more time in, investing in this. One thing I should mention with respect to PowerShell version 5, since PowerShell version 5 is now uh, in the pipeline and it's in Tech Preview and a bunch of different versions of Windows that are out there, one of the things that uh, that they solve in PowerShell version 5 is, is this problem. So get service. Um, and I'm going to pipe that to format table name and status. The name of this plane doesn't matter. Measure properties. And so there I go and I get all those those properties. And um, actually, let me do a smaller view just so I can make my point better. Oops. Only a few services. So here, see this great big gap in between here? That is uh, just the default way PowerShell formatting works. I mean, if I go and I want to pick that to another one, or that same command, and then another field status. So now PowerShell has figured out what the width of my window is, and and then divided that by three and created some some columns and does some truncation, and it's just generally not, not that fun to look at. And so, um, so, what I what they've done in PowerShell version five, and then you can see this in the latest versions, is when you pipe to format table like this, it is smarter and it'll try to figure out within a certain uh, timeout what the maximum width is for a particular column and do auto sizing auto automatically as you get the output, which is nice. And so that's one of the things I want to push into this. Um, and, and so I'm that's one thing where I'm actually inconsistent with PowerShell, where they've made one minor improvement. In, in version 5 that I don't get to have in mind. And so if you're tinkering with PowerShell version 5 and you start using my module and you realize, whoa, wait a minute, it's not doing the nice tight column format that I was doing before, um, it may do it in certain, certain circumstances, and I can think of somewhere it will. It may not in others. I haven't tested it a whole lot. I just, I, I, so I need to do some more work in that area, but it's, it's still because PowerShell version 5 is only CTP. And I'm, this is all PowerShell version 3 and 4 stuff, by the way. I should have mentioned that at the beginning. Most of the modules I work on are PowerShell version 3 or later because I like to create solutions for today that I can use now while all the new stuff is coming down the pipeline and see what I can borrow from those and, and pull those back to. So, um, so yeah, you may you may see some some quirkiness in that area in PowerShell version 5, but you might not. I have to do more testing in that area. Now, next module, uh, Snippet PX. This one's a lot shorter. So uh, Snippet PX is a module that I use as a helper to all other modules that I have in the system uh, that, I, that I create. So if I run get module right now, you see format PX is loaded and debug PX is loaded. But what you don't see 
is that it also has snippet px loaded. And it's loaded hidden. And the reason why it's loaded hidden is because it loads as, as, a, as a nested module. If you're ever wondering what the difference is in sort of a module manifest between a required module and a nested module, this is it. Nested modules are loaded, but only in the scope of the modules in which they're loaded, and they're hidden from general exposure, which makes sense because sometimes you have a utility module and you don't want somebody to look at that and say, what's that? I didn't load that. Where'd that come from? And so it's it's used internally, but it's not doesn't necessarily need it to be exposed. So so it's loaded by format px in the manifest and by history px and debug px and type px. And every module I create loads it. Why? So um, when you create modules, well, first let me show you the commands that are there. So there's two commands. There's get snippet and invoke snippet. Get snippet goes and gets snippets that are available in a local system, and invoke snippet invokes one. The invoke snippet is the reason why I created this module. When I, when you're creating scripts or modules, there are plenty of scenarios where you have a certain block of code that you repeat from one to another because you just do it as boilerplate or a certain thing that you do a certain way all the time. And that's code duplication. And then if, if you do that repetition across script files or across module manifests, or sorry, I should say across script modules, and then later on you want to go through and you realize, oh, shoot, I should have done that differently. Then you've got to go and change all the places where you use that particular block of code that certain way. And that's annoying. And so one solution to that is to create a function. And, and that sort of solves the problem, but yet there are plenty of scenarios where you don't want a function for something because it's just all, maybe it's only two lines of code. But yet those two lines of code are still copied and pasted, and you might want to change something about those two lines of code and have that change affected everywhere. And it might not make sense to have it be a function because I don't, I don't create functions for everything. Um, I create functions for things that are going to, that the commands I'm going to want to use in PowerShell to do stuff on a regular basis, not for blocks of code that I want to copy and paste somewhere. It's, and, and there's cases where you can't even create a function to do something because when you create a function and then you run in that function, that function has a child scope. And as soon as you introduce scope, then how variables work are different and so it might just, just not work the same way. That's why I created snippet px, to allow me to have these small blocks of code that I can invoke in the here and now, wherever I call invoke snippet, it's going to run that block of, snow, block of code at that location, at that point in time, in that scope. And so in that scope, that's that's the key part that I really was trying to solve. And and yet still being able to do it, it's still, still being able to do it in a discoverable way. I didn't have to go and create functions that had some internal hack to make them run locally, which technically I haven't figured out how to do, and I, I'd like to, but I haven't uh, figured out how to do to make them run in a local scope um, reliably across all versions of PowerShell. So, um, so this allows me to do that. That allows me to run these little bits. So what are snippets? Snippets are just PS1 files. Let me go to my uh, file system here for a second and browse into my modules. So inside of, uh, I've got some in snippet PX. Let me go in there. Inside of, scroll down a bit, scroll down a bit. Okay. Inside of snippet PX, there is this folder called snippets. Inside of that folder, there's a bunch of PS1 files. By the way, I apologize for the size of this. I know it's smaller compared to the rest of my screen, um, but I'm not going to change my window size right now. Um, but these are just a bunch of PS1 files. And if you open up one of these guys, let's go, for example, module.initialize. If I open that up, actually that one, I'll open up over here. Uh, oh, but I can't because it's elevated probably, so let me open it this way. Open modules. Um, scroll down. Snippet PX. And so let's, so this this right here, this is a example of a snippet. I use uh, comment-based help, just like you would use for functions. And it, they can have parameters. And so in this case, I have a parameter. And yeah, I do like snippets. <laughs> There's a... Uh, quite a lot of uh, updates to that, that module, and I use them all over the place. Um, sorry, that was just responding to a comment in the chat room. Somebody's noticing from my version history, I like snippets. And so um, this, this particular snippet is 
a snippet that I invoke at the top of every module I write, because it does a couple of things that are just really, really useful. It clears the PS default parameter values because, and only in the module scope, because if you don't do that, user configuration can muck with how your module works. And so as a best practice, inside of a module, at the top of your PSM1 file, you should do this. So this does that. It sets the strict mode. And by default, I go to latest. There are, uh, the only case where I will not go to latest is if I'm dealing with a module that uses WMI, because WMI has some quirks with latest strict mode that causes it to generate some errors. Um, but just in general, all the current modules I'm working on that are not using WMI, I set the strict mode to version latest. And the reason why I use strict mode is because it makes PowerShell watch my back. It makes it so that PowerShell will point out when I forget to, when I, when I try to use a variable or a property on a variable that's not initialized versus just silently saying, oh, there's nothing there, so I'll return nothing. And that's important because if you don't do that in your script or in your module, and then somebody goes and, co and, and loads your, your code into your, your PowerShell logic into another environment, so they import your module, and they have to be using strict mode, it can cause your module to function differently and to spit out errors that you didn't detect because you didn't run it with strict mode. So it's another best practice. So this is about just certain things that you want to do all the time, right? So I, I set the strict mode. I set export module member to explicit mode. So this, when it, by running this command by itself, means that anything that I want exported, I have to later on call export module member with that particular command name to export it. And I do that so there's no surprises. So I don't export stuff by, de by, by default because I don't want surprises. I want to know that the stuff I export, I did it on purpose. And then I also go and I define a couple of variables that I use in my module. Um, so because I hate typing out in modules um, execution context.sessionState.module to refer to the module. So I set this variable, ps module equals that. And also, if I want to know what the root folder is for the module I'm working on, well, then I set that variable too. ps module root is equal to the module dot module base. So that gives me just context references if I'm dealing with file system stuff and referencing a folder on my file system or to, to load something or, or or if I want to set up how a module closes, I need to call, normally I need to set set the script block for execution context dot session state dot module dot uh, on close, I think it is. And, and instead I could just do dollar sign ps module dot on close and it's cleaner and tidier. So these things, why would I copy and paste this every single time I write a module? I don't want to. And actually, put case in point, very recently, this is, this was added. I added this to my snippet because um, I learned that uh, this is a necessary best practice because I found from the community somebody was walking around with PS default parameter values and it broke one of my modules. And this is the way to prevent that. And so I added it. And but I only had to add it in one spot, my snippet, and boom, automatically all my modules get it because they are invoking a snippet. So it's, it's, it's quite nice and handy to have that support. And um, uh, there's a bunch of snippets that are in there, so you can see the snippets that I have. I, I don't have a huge number right now. I mean, uh, that ran by quickly. Let me run that again with format table. So um, yeah, so right now there's like a dozen snippets in there. Uh, that clears your variables on invocation of a new script. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, so it's uh, quite handy to, to, to uh, are you referring to, sorry, just asking, answering a question in the chat room. You're referring to the um, PS default parameter values uh, clear? Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's necessary. Just to emphasize the importance of this, um, Get snippet internally invokes get help. And somebody in the community had a great idea of, they said that, uh, well, if you, if you run get help on command, so get help, get uh, service, you can run it with uh, show window, which is cool, right? Because I get this, this UI. And so when you're working with PowerShell a lot and you want to see the help rather than scrolling through it, in a, in, a, in a command dialog, you can you can scroll it here and you can search, and that's quite handy. But um, so so they had the idea. I'm going to change my my profile and I'm going to do this. PS default parameter values, um, and I'll add one for get help for the show window parameter 
and I want that to be equal to true all the time. And so they put that in their profile. So now when you do that, and you run GitHub Git Service, you get the window. And so they're thinking, that's great, because whenever they get help, they just want to see it in the window. So, so good for them. Works in their environment. But internally, my snippet module is pulling help information, because I showed you it uses comment-based help. And so you see here, synopsis, that's pulled, because internally it calls get help. And so what happened is a customer, uh, a user was out in the community. I shouldn't say customer. I mean, these are free, free modules. A user in the community was um, invoking a command that internally uses snippets, and all of a sudden a whole bunch of windows popped up. And they're like, what's up with that? Why am I getting help windows show up? What broke? And so I found out that this was why. And so the solution was inside of my module to uh, do ps default parameter values uh, dot clear. Because by doing this in a module scope, you don't have to worry about mucking around with the user's preferences. They're still preserved, because ps default parameter values is a variable that is set in every single scope, and it's inherited into each scope. And so modules normally will just inherit it and say, great, I'll take whatever you got, and I'm going to do that. But that's not good when you're calling stuff internally that you don't want it to do those things. So just put this in your PSM1 file at the top, or invoke my snippet. Um, and so I should show you also how I invoke that. Uh, if I go to a module that uses snippets, and let's go to format PX, and right at the top of my PSM1 file, the first thing, well, second thing you'll see, not the first thing, the second thing you'll see is invoke snippet module.initialize. Because that module initialize snippet that I showed you does this work and runs it in the current scope, and, and I'm good to go. So that's why you want to do that. Um, whew, so, um, yeah, lots of information, but uh, I think it's, uh, it, this is quite useful. And, and, and since I've adopted this stuff, I wouldn't turn back because I just find this is, is too too valuable for the work I do. It saves me so much time. Um, so yeah, so Gnomo snippet allows it to allows you to kind of centralize that code without uh, making it into a function. And, oh, and I should mention when you when you run Git snippet, the way it works, uh, if you want to create your own snippets, Git snippet will look at modules on your system that are discoverable via PS module path the environment variable, and it'll check, do those have a snippet subfolder? If so, it'll get the PS1 files that are in those, and those will be available. So you can write snippets for your own modules that maybe cover certain use cases that are just common use cases where people want to do stuff. Or maybe the, you want to write snippets for your modules that you're using internally. You can do that. And the snippet PX module will just pick them up, and they'll be available. Uh, and these names, module.initialize and proxy function.begin and whatnot, are all based on the name of the PS1 file where I found the snippet. And so it'll go and just use that as the name, go inside and pull out some uh, command uh, or comment-based help so you can get help information so that they're discoverable uh, and so you can read about both them uh, and then they just work. Um, and so you'll see in the side of the modules, I mean, this is a good example. So I invoke snippet here to invoke module.initialize. And then, actually, sorry, I'll show you a better example. Because uh, format PX, it uses a binary module, so the commands are internal. But if I go and open up another module, like uh, DOPX, uh, which is DigitalOcean, PowerShell DigitalOcean, by the way, is a cloud service for uh, doing virtual machine management, much like Azure and, and Amazon. And so I've got a, a PowerShell module for um, uh, managing their service. It needs a little bit of an update since they went and pushed out the RTM of their REST API, but uh, it still works pretty well for the most part. And so you see inside of here, um, invoke snippet module initialize, invoke snippet script file import, because I follow the same layout for all of my uh, modules, where I will put anything that is an internal command inside of a PS1 file that's in the helpers subfolder. Anything that is an exported command goes into a PS1 file inside of the functions folder. And this snippet is smart enough to automatically import all of those. I don't have to come through and modify it and add and add and add. I just drop a new PS1 file in, and this snippet discovers that and loads it for me, and I'm good to go. So it's, it's uh, again, less code, smarter decisions, and um, if I need to make a fix or a change to one of these things, I change it one place, and everybody gets it. So, so that's what the bits are all about. Now, uh, next one. Let me uh, jump back. Oh, yeah, was the last thing I was going to do, just show you this. So it's just here's an example of a snippet in action, right? So I can assign a variable to Mississippi PowerShell user group, 
and then I can invoke a snippet uh, string.expand, and the string I'm going to expand, this is showing you how you can run a snippet with parameters. So my parameters are a hash table, because I can't do dash parameters on a snippet because it's not a function. So if you use param inside of a snippet, then you're going to use a hash table to pass through, essentially almost like splatting, the parameters that are, going to, that are actually going to, going to go into the snippet to make it do its work. And so here I'll run this snippet, and it goes and replaces that audience. Notice this is a single quoted string, so that didn't get replaced by PowerShell. The, the snippet itself does that using this expansion logic to go through and replace the variable with the value. Um, and there's a number of cases where I find that that was useful. And so that's just an example of, of a simple snippet invocation uh, showing how you use it with parameters. Next up, history PX. Um, so history, history is interesting. So uh, let me just show you what history looks like by default. So you run history, and you see you get a list of everything that you ran so far. And by default, you get ID, and you get the command line that you ran. It's useful if you want to go back and you want to rerun something, because here I can then go and say, well, I want to rerun. Uh, let's say I want to rerun uh, this command, line 35, get service, format table, uh, display name. Um, or actually, let's go back further. Here's this one that's longer, um, module info page of format list property, and then it's got a whole bunch of stuff, and I don't even get to see the whole thing. And so I can't just go back and copy and paste it, but I can see it's history number 23. So I can just go invoke history ID 23, and I rerun that. So you can rerun commands that you ran before. But I want to get back to my, my history view here. And so, so that, that's useful, but there's a lot more information there. Uh, and one of the things I should do, um, let me just show you this. So I'll take my script here on the fly. So there's more data in behind history. There is, um, aside from the command line, and the actual ID, there is start execution time and end execution time. And this is all default boilerplate built into PowerShell since version one. Uh, and there's also execution status. And so this is useful. And so if I do history, um, by the way, H is, H is short for guest history, it's the alias. And I type that to format table star, uh, then I can see more information. So I don't get to see all of my command line, but I can see my execution status. Did the command actually run to completion or not? And I can see start and end execution time. And so that's useful because, well, if I have start and end execution time, that means I can uh, see duration, right? I can figure out how long did the command take to run. But I have to then do that calculation or modify the data or whatever. And, and so I started looking. That, that's kind of where history PX started. I looked at that and I thought, well, I want the duration in there by default. So let's add that. And then I started looking at more things in a group. And so let me show you what history PX looks like. So I'm going to import history PX. And now I'm going to just run a few uh, errors, or run a few commands and generate a few errors here. The, the, what these do is not really important. I'm just going to go get a bunch of services. Then I'll create an error because this service does not exist. I'll invoke a command that does not exist. Get the current process. Get a bunch of processes. You'll see how many Chrome windows I have open. It's shameful. I, I keep a lot of Chrome window, windows open. And then um, I'm going to do one divided by zero and get an error. So I'll just run this block. So you see some errors show up bunch of output, and then some errors again. And so um, so that's, that's you know, you're typically working with PowerShell on a regular basis. You get some data sometimes. Sometimes things don't work. So now let's take a look at the history, because I loaded history PX earlier. So in this case, and I'm going to actually go full screen on this one for a second. Um, what do I want to do? There. So now look at this output instead. So the, I still have ID and command line. But I also have duration. So if I'm running commands and I'm working on scripts and performance is important, I can quickly see, oh, it ran faster before. Oh, no, look, it's faster now. And so as I'm running it and doing iterations and testing, I can quickly see, am I doing the right thing because I want to improve performance or not? And it tells me, did the command succeed or not, success or fail? And this is a more accurate rating for success than completed. Completed just means the command completed. It doesn't mean it ran properly or not. And so this tells me, did the command actually run successfully? Did it have any errors? If so, how many? And what was output by the command? That's the default output. So, so if you look at this last command that I ran, uh, where did I import my module? Oh, wait a minute. I did that in the wrong order. One second. So I import my module. 
Oh, I know why. Because I did F8 and I ran into individual, individual command. So you see command here, 54, get service, W star, dot, dot, dot. It ran that as one block. I want to break that up. So let me just back up here. I'm going to run this again. So I got my history module loaded. So get my services that start with W. Find one that doesn't exist. Run a command that's not on my system. Get the current process. Go and get my Chrome uh, processes. And now divide by zero. And now get history shows me a lot more useful information. So here's, look at the bottom part of this window. Let me go full screen again. So here I see each individual command, success or not, so false, true, false, true. How many errors, if there were errors that showed up? And also, if it got data, what data it had? So that, let me go a little deeper into this and show you, um, well, actually, one more thing first. I'm going to add one more command to this list. So here, I ran the same command. See, well, see command line 61, 1 divided by 0, right? 1 divided by 1 minus 1. It creates an error. And now, this time I ran it again inside of try catch. And this is not about terminating errors, and I'll talk about that a little bit more on debugpx. Um, so there, I just ran that same command, generated a terminating error. And now, look at get history output. See that exclamation mark right here? So that was added because history now knows that it ran into a terminating error, meaning the script stopped dead. If after this command on the same line of code, I had other stuff here, doesn't matter what it is, then I ran this. And notice that whatever did not show up in the output because that is a single command that was run. It generated a terminating error. And so I get one error. I'm only ever, if I get terminating, I'm only ever, going, only ever going to get one because terminating is terminating. It stops at the first one it, it finds. And so this is, two, two things are useful about this. One, it shows you when you ran a command, if you actually get a full view of all the errors that the command generated, or did you run into something that was terminating, terminating or not, just by showing that this bang symbol. And two, it highlights a, a very interesting um, caveat about PowerShell, and that is, when you run a PowerShell command, if you don't wrap that command inside of try catch, and that command's going to generate a terminating error, it won't terminate. It'll actually generate a non-terminating error instead. So, so it's a weird behavior, uh, I can call it a gotcha or a quirk or whatever you want to call it, about PowerShell, where terminating errors are not terminating unless they're wrapped in try catch. Why is it important to know that? Because if you run if you create a script, let's say you create this script and uh, in somebody else's environment, that script encounters an error. You're going to get different behaviors based on that error, based on the user's environment, depending on how they invoked it. If they invoke it with try catch, inside of a try catch block, then a terminating error in your script will be treated as terminating. If not, then a terminating error won't be terminating, in which case the script will continue to run and it might do things you don't want it to do. So as a best practice, I try catch everything, absolutely everything at the top level. You don't have to do every single script block, but at the top level. Just, I'm, I'm going to talk about that more with you about PX, or maybe I won't since we're talking about it now, but let me go back into um, this from a PX module. So I, I say I try catch. Trap is another way to do try catch. So even inside of a PSM1 file, here's a PSM1 file, a script module. If I try to import, and this is something that just really bugs me, if I try to import a script module and the PSM1 file generates an error and I don't use trap or try catch around the entire contents of the script module, then that error will show up and the module will load in whatever state it happens to be in but it might be totally broken and unfunctional, it might do things you don't want it to do. But the module itself in the PSM1 file generates an error that would be terminating if it's in try catch. So wouldn't you want it to be a terminating error in that case? If so, and that's, that's my philosophy, I want terminating errors to be terminating every time. And the only way you get that is by using trap at the top. And so I use trap here. This was Joel Bennett's 
uh, J. Cole, uh, another Power Show MVP, his suggestion, instead of try catching, because if I try catch this, then it means I do try, and then around, around this whole thing, right? So that I, could, I could have done this, and this is how I had done it at first. Uh, that, and then I come down and select, 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 and then tab indent, and so all, and, and then catch, right? And because I tab indent my blocks, throw, and so I could do that. But in a module, uh, in a script module, tab indenting the entire thing is kind of ugly, and, and it's not really what you, not, not just, it's just not as elegant. And so instead of doing that, <coughs> excuse me, I just do this at the very top, which gives me the exact same effect. And so make sure, if you're concerned with this, which I think you should be, that you use trap so that terminating errors are terminating, or that you wrap everything in try catch. So go back to where I was. So that's all I did here. And, and when you catch, you're going to rethrow it. So it's not like you're doing something with it. And so that's it's kind of annoying that you need to do this. But it's it's how PowerShell works. And so I say just do it because it, it just makes sense. So all you do, if you want to add this to your logic, is wrap it inside of a try, and you can wrap an entire script file, or an entire inside of a module block, a begin, process, or end block, or, or sorry, a function, I should say, a begin, process, or end block, and a function, and so just, just put a try block, and then have catch, and then inside of your catch, you just throw. You don't have to just throw. You can do other things, and dollar sign under bar will be the exception that you caught. So you can you can do all dollar under bar dot message, uh, and then add some text to it if you want to, or different things. But as a general rule, I don't. I just do try catch throw, and um, since I'm on that topic, I got to go one more level de deeper in in the, in the details of how I throw. Um, if I go to let me pick a command, uh, debug px functions. So here's a command. Here, here's how I do it. So here's my function and the function body. And in this case, it doesn't have a begin process or end block. So there's my try, what the function does. Here's catch. And here I'm not doing throw. Here I'm doing different. And so when commandlet binding is available, which it is if you're using command, uh, when it is if you're using advanced functions, and you define command, commandlet binding or advanced parameters, then instead of throw here, you should do ps commandlet throw terminating error and pass it in the exception. And the reason why you should do that is because of a difference in how PowerShell shows the output. If you just do throw, then PowerShell is going to show you that there was an error on line 65 inside of this function, and the line that was run was throw. But that's not useful to an end user. An end user may have called enable breakpoint command, right? I mean, look at this. If I go back here and I do get service, that does not exist. What does it tell me? It doesn't tell me something internal about the get service command where the throw line was. It tells me what? Get service, fail. There's my command name. What was the error? Colon. Here's the error message. I like that format. And users like that format. It makes it easier. The way you get that format with your error is this. Just command like that throw any error and passing dollar order bar. That will make it so that if this does get an error, then the user's going to see in red text, enable dash breakpoint command, colon, and then whatever the error text was, followed by the actual line that they invoked that caused that error. Not internal stuff that's inside of your function or script, which they shouldn't have to care about. Useful for you, not so much for them. So that's an important distinction. Anyway, small aside. Um, let me go back to, uh, yeah, that's good. Close that now and go back to where I was. So um, history. So yeah, so I got a bunch of history and I can get the, er the, get the errors that are output and I can go back and, and get some of that data that I had before, right? So I can look at the history, getting back to where I was. And you see here, line 54, it got a bunch of services starting with W. And so I can now go uh, and say uh, history ID, uh, where is it, 54, and dot output. And is that right? Hold up. Yep. And run that. And there's my collection I got. So it's actually storing things that come back from my uh, from my commands. Oh, that must be when I did 
more than just get, yeah, I did get service plus other stuff. So that stores more output. So anyway, if I go back to this one here that's just using get service w star or get process id pid, that's a good example because it's nice and small. So let's do the same thing for 59. So there's that output from line 59. So it's actually caching and storing these things. And so that's really useful because you can go back and recall stuff. So if you if you run a command that goes across the network and gets a bunch of data and you forgot to store that in a variable, and you think, oh shoot, I can go run that whole command again. Well, no, it stores it for you to a certain maximum, and that's configurable. And so um, I'll just change the order of these since I'm talking about this in this order. Uh, so. Yeah, so I've got two commands inside of history px that allow you to uh, four commands. So there's get and set. So get capture output configuration, and get extended history configuration. So the one I'm talking about right now is this one. So here you can see the maximum entry count is 200, and the maximum item count per entry is a thousand. And so that means it's going to hold a maximum of 200,000 record objects in in its history. So if you um, and, and as soon as this entry count expires, as soon as it gets to entry 201, then entry 200 goes. If entry 200 had, uh, yeah, sorry, I just see somebody, uh, Mike just said download and install history PX. Looks like it also requires snippet PX. All of my modules require snippet PX. So if you want to download one, download a snippet PX as well. Otherwise, you're going to try to load it, and it's going to say, I can't find snippet PX. You need that as a prerequisite. Um, so, uh, so now if you, yes, yeah, you store a maximum of 200,000 records. And, uh, if you run into, as soon as you get to the 201st entry, then the last, the oldest one will be removed. So if I go into history here, here, you only see, I've got like, well, there's like about 20 records here. And if I ran this over and over and over again, it's not going to make your system bloat, 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 holding all these objects forever, for forever. It'll clean up after a certain amount. And those are configurable. You can make those smaller or bigger if you want. Um, I had a suggestion, and this would be decent feedback from the community. Um, Lee Holmes suggested that uh, instead of doing 200,000 rec, or instead of doing, sorry, a table like I'm doing right now, where I have maximum entries, 200, maximum item count, 1,000, he said I might just want to have it store whatever you get back to a maximum of a certain count. So let's say I make this be one field, 200,000. If that's an option that would appeal to you, I could change that. I don't know that it's going to matter that much, but maybe if you're getting back a lot of data, uh, I typically don't deal with pulling back a thousand plus records at a time on a regular basis, so it hasn't been an issue for me so much. So just think about that and let me know if you, what you think about the feedback uh, on, on that one. Um, another thing in History PX that it does. So it's storing stuff, right? Because I showed you it's caching it and showing and storing it. So if I run get service, there I got all my services. But oh shoot, I ran that across the network, it was really slow, took a long time, and I forgot to store it. It adds this dollar sign underbar underbar variable. So there's that dollar sign underbar underbar is like a magic virtual virtual assistant. It's like having somebody watching over your shoulder taking notes as you're going along, right? So this goes and stores um, the last command. But it's smart about it. So, so let's say I'm I'm doing things interactively, and this is this is based on my use cases. If your use cases are different and you have some ideas of how this could change, feel free to let me know. Based on my use cases, if I'm working with something and I get back the results, and then I want to do something, I want to pipe that to something, I want to call some command based on that. That's typically how I work. I'll run a command, do something with it. I'll run a command, do something with the data. This, let's say I want to look at the names of those services. There's all my names. And let's say I want to look at a specific name. I have a specific name. But at the same time, it didn't change my collection. So it's being, it's trying to be smart. It's trying to say, well, you're dealing with properties of a collection that you already have in memory, and I'm already holding on to the collection for you. So I'm not going to go and replace that collection with the value of those properties because that would be dumb. Then your, then your collection's gone, and then you have to go rerun the command to go get that again. So instead, I'm going to hold on to the collection, let you go and do some work with it, but I'll hold on to it. And, and maybe while you're doing that, you might want to go and look up some health information. So I'm going to go and get some help. Oh, and look, it still remembers that I set that setting earlier, so it pops up my help information, so I can go and read about the command. But then that 
It's just help information. And even if I didn't have that, so even if I did ps default parameter values dot clear, right? And so I do get help and it shows it in my console, in which case it's actually object data going back to the console. And my assistant says, well, no, that's, that's help information. It's good for you, but I'm not going to hold on to it because I've got data you want. And so it tries to be smart about things like that. Let's say you want to pipe to um, get member, right? You want to see what something can do. So there, I can see what it does, but I don't want get member information stored. I want my collection. And so it's those use cases that I tried to solve that with this, trying to make it so that it's it's kind of just somebody that watches over my shoulder. If I forget to do a variable assignment, and then this guy's doing it for me, and so I can kind of rely on it. I don't have the exact exact list off the top of my head of which commands and which type of objects I ignore, but um, I know a few of them. For example, I ignore get help. I ignore uh, results of git member, I ignore, hist I ignore history, right? I mean, if I go and do history, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Oh, no, I'm not actually sorry. That's a case where I'm not. If you run history, uh, then I'm not ignoring it. Maybe I should. So that's one I, right now I'm thinking I'm on the fence on. Maybe I shouldn't have my virtual uh, uh, assistant store my history because I can pull that up anytime. Uh, so that's something I could change. So this is, this is a little bit experimental. Um, people generally like it from what I've heard so far. If you have feedback, if there are certain object types you think don't make sense for this to go and update, this history one to me is questionable, then then uh, let me know, and I'll, and I'll see what I can do. Um, oh, and this comment down here about the manual demo, I showed you that earlier. That was just me doing things like um, uh, history ID uh, uh, 74 dot input. And so just going back and getting. Uh, some of those, those those histories. I just didn't know what my IDs would be, so I couldn't put them in, in there. So that's where I'm uh, at with history PX right now. Um, I already talked a little bit about this, sort of. So um, debug PX. Debugging is interesting. There's a bunch of things you need to think about, like the try catch. I talked about that. That's really important. So make sure you're, you're paying attention to that. Um, now, let me show you uh, a few things here that you can you can do in PowerShell. Um, so I'm going to do this. I created this file a while ago. I'm just trying to find my notes. Uh, yeah. So okay. I know what I'm missing. If I go, let's say I want to hit a breakpoint, right? So I can put a breakpoint on this file, and so actually, I'm just going to do this in a brand new file because I don't want to have everything else in this file run. So I just do a new window and save that and uh, oops, save that as uh, colon match last test. Oh, this one. Uh, that's fine. So um, so I got this file and I want to debug it. And if you guys know about the debugger inside of IEC, it's really useful and you should use it because it's it's just very handy, right? So I can I can run this file. Stops in a breakpoint. I can hit F10 to step over that line. And so now I'm on the next line. It shows you my current line. And I can see what my current value of S is. So I can come here and do interactive work while I'm running, running my script. Very useful. Um, and that's just breakpointing in PowerShell how it works. And so then it would have stopped that service if it didn't have the wave command. So, so, so that's handy. But then there's a bunch of things that that doesn't do. So for example, compare that to native PowerShell. Now this is small. Um, and so uh, let's say I want to, to debug this. So the, th the same command, right? So um, I've got my command, get content. Test .ds1. So there's my command, and I want to debug that. But I'm using native PowerShell, not ISC. Maybe I prefer using Sublime as my script editor, and native PowerShell or ConyMU or some other uh, host because performance is fast on those and a lot of people like to do that. So what, what can I do for debugging? Well, I can do set uh, ps breakpoint uh, dash line one dash script uh, c colon backslash test dot ps1 and now I can just run backslash test dot ps1 and so there I hit my breakpoint. And, and so when, when, you, when you're on a breakpoint, and I talk about this right here, you can have a look around to see where you're at. So I can hit L to see where I'm at in my script file. The star shows me what line I'm on. They're numbered by uh, the numbers of lines in the file that I'm currently in. And it shows me 
give or take 10 lines before and after my current location. So, so quite useful stuff. And um, you can also see if you invoke this uh, from another file, where are you in their call stack? So K will get your call stack information. Of course, I could have just ran get ps call stack. Um, that's K is an alias for that inside of the debugger. So, so you can run K. Uh, and then there's a lot of helpful commands available other than just L and K. So you can hit H or, uh, or uh, question mark, either one works. And it shows you the, th the things you can do. And so I showed you in ISE how I can step over the current line, right? I hit F10, which is step over. And so that means it's not going to go into my function. If it was a function, it's just going to run it and go to the next line in my current file. Well, I can do the same thing here. I can hit V. And so I stepped over the line I was on. And so it's a less visual debugging experience, although it shows you, you know, what you're doing right here inside my window, which is still useful. But I had to do that step dash ps breakpoint with the right line number, which can be complicated. And there's other ways you can do it, but still it's not the visual breakpointing that I'd like to have. So I'm just going to hit C to continue this when it's done. Now, consider this way. Um, let me open up my file. Let me put it on my desktop so you can see it. And this time, I'm going to put a breakpoint in the file just by typing in breakpoint. Or I could just do BP for, for short. Those are both aliases for a command that is in debug PX. So I've got my breakpoint set. And, oh shoot, I opened that from a non elevated session. And so that's not going to work. Uh, let me do it over here because this guy's already elevated. So I'll change my file here. Um, th this is an example where, let's say I'm using Sublime or some other editor, Notepad++, or just Notepad or whatever, and doing some quick modifications, and I want to set a breakpoint in a file where I don't have a breakpoint, and so I don't have this nice visual queue or whatever, and I don't have ISC handy, or I just don't use it because it can be slow sometimes. And so so this is an example of what you can do with that, right? So I, I have my breakpoint, my file saved, and uh, if I run get ps breakpoint over here, I still have it, so I'll remove that. My breakpoints are gone inside of ISC or inside of PowerShell. I've got no breakpoints. Now I'm going to run the com backslash test.ps1, and boom, it hits a breakpoint. So that's one of the things that Debug PX gives you. It gives you visual breakpoints by giving you a breakpoint command or a BP command. And why is that useful? Well, a bunch of reasons. It's useful because Sometimes you're debugging something and you're working with it day to day, and you want to have a breakpoint and then come back the next day after a reboot or after you close files down, and your breakpoints still be there. This this allows you to do that. If I close ISE and I open up ISE another day, my breakpoints are gone, but this will preserve it. So that's one. Two, again, dealing with Notepad++ or Sublime Text Editor or name your favorite editor under the sun that's nice and fast and snappy and maybe even has um, syntax highlighting and maybe even has intelligence, but it doesn't have a debugger, well, this gives you some debugging, because you can just type stuff in and then run it, and you get debugging. So I find this quite handy for those reasons. Three, another reason. Um, if, I, if I'm an ISE and I put a breakpoint on this line, it puts a breakpoint on the entire line. So number three here, I've got a breakpoint, and it's going to stop at the very first that line. And then it's I, I, I don't get the breakpoints in the middle, maybe where I wanted to, in my pipeline. Um, and I can come over here, and I can hit the breakpoint there instead, and see, it gives me the same thing, right? So, but I, I can do this, which is kind of snazzy. I'm going to change my command here. Get service W star, so all my W services, and I'm going to pipe that to stop service what if, right? So if I run this now, uh, let me hit continue to finish the execution of what I had, and now I'll rerun that command. I already saved it. My breakpoint's gone. Now look, it would remove all those windows. Uh, we would stop all those window services, right? And maybe I want to break somewhere in the middle of the pipeline. Maybe I want to break when dollar underbar dot service uh, dot name is equal to the Windows Update service. So this now run this. It went and did all those Windows services up to that point, and then boom, it stops in the middle of a pipeline when a certain condition happens. So I, that's really, really useful because sometimes you have pipelining, and uh, 
it's you just you just need to figure out what's going on right in the middle, but you don't want to do step, 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 step forever because that's, that's really painful and slow. So this gives you that conditional, I'm going to break on the spot when I want to break. And so now that I've broken here, if I look at the learn bar, there's my Windows Update service. So that that's really useful for the pipeline thing. Thanks for the feedback. I, uh, yeah, I really find this one's quite handy. Um, and maybe something really obscure. Maybe I've got a, a script that there's just some weird error that happens once in a while. And I can articulate that error in terms of like a script block, you know, some, some value or some property is equal to something else. But I want to, I, I wish I could catch that in the debugger, but it's intermittent and it just, just doesn't work. And so I can put in a conditional breakpoint for this thing that's weird that just never happens. And I can add a message that says, Oh my God, it happened. And so, so I just do this and go back here again, finish that execution of that command. And now when I run this command again, I get a breakpoint and I also get uh, right here, breakpoint with the comment. So I can throw something into a script that's being quirky on a particular machine, or maybe I'm using a script internally in my environment and some other users are intermittently experiencing some issue, and I'm like, oh, I wish I could be looking over your shoulder when that issue happens and figure what's going on. This gives you that vehicle. So this allows you to put a breakpoint in, and they'd have to, of course, have debug PX on their system, which would, of course, require a snippet PX because there's dependencies, but it's just giving you a vehicle where you can work through some of these more obscure, weird things that are going on, and use smart PowerShell uh, script blocks to do breakpoints conditionally and figure things out. You can't do conditional breakpoints this easy, even in ISE. You, you, you can do it, but you've got to do set dash ps breakpoint and then dash action and uh, and create an action and, and all of that. So so that's what that's what debug px is kind of all about right now. Um, I talked about some of these things already here. Yes, yeah, so importing the module, uh, putting breakpoints. Yeah, BP is an alias. Um, uh, yeah, the alias is for this command, so enter debugger, that's the actual command behind breakpoint, uh, but I always just type in breakpoint because visually if I'm scanning a file, I see it much more quickly. I know aliases are not supposed to use them in production scripts, but this is about debugging, so this is my personal exception to this rule. I will always use these aliases and never use enter dash debugger because I want to scan and find this stuff. Um, here's showing the pipeline work, here's showing pipeline with uh, uh, with the um, script block and then a uh, certain fucking condition. So that's that's how debug PX works. There's a bunch of other things I'm working on in debug PX, um, but I haven't quite gotten there yet. Um, but anyway, that's that's there for you guys to take a look at. The last, uh, let's see if you have PSV5. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so Mike just threw into the chat window if you've got PSV5 install dash module dash name, and then you can type in the names of all these modules. Um, Although the only thing I would differ with you, Mike, is I wouldn't put them into current user. The only reason why, well, unless you have to, um, if you're installing these modules using PowerShell Get, you can use current user or you can use all user scope. I reserve current user for the stuff that's my modules that I work on, and so that way then I go into my Windows PowerShell modules folder under my documents folder, I see my things. And those are the things that I don't have control over, or sorry, those are the things I have control over. The stuff I downloaded from community, I recommend if you can do it, put it into program files, Windows PowerShell modules instead, the all users location, but that requires elevation. But as a best practice, I find it's better because you shouldn't be mucking around with the internals of those things anyway. They're owned and managed by somebody else. And so why not put them in a location that's outside of your own current stuff? I mean, there are other ways you could do it. You could use PS module path instead of a different location that's inside of your um, documents folder that you don't need elevation for and maybe put them in there instead but I just general personal use I, I recommend using if you have access to elevation just throwing them into the Windows PowerShell modules folder. So the last one uh, type px and what's missing at the top is import module type px. Um, so the last module I want to talk about for now is this one and so if I import this module type px it's a module that I like but I have some my own personal issues with it one of my personal issues with TypePX is this. I just hit load here. It takes a little while to load. I don't like modules to take a lot of load. It's not a heck of a long time, but it's a little while. 
The reason why it's a little while is because this is a script module. Many of my modules are binary modules these days for performance of the commands, as well as for load time of the module, mostly for performance of the commands, because they're really snappy. They just work, and, and they work almost as fast as the regular commands in native PowerShell, so you don't really notice the difference. TypePX is written all in PowerShell. It's using the extended type system to add extensions to PowerShell that are PowerShell scripts, and that makes it be slower. I have a personal to-do that I want to start converting some of those and pulling those into a binary module instead, so I have the same extensions and things just work, but the module loads faster because I just don't like that module load time. That's just my own personal issue with it. It still is a useful module, despite the fact that it takes a few seconds to load. What this module does is it creates a whole lot of extensions that are designed to um, give you methods and properties on objects that you don't have by default. So if you look at uh, an array, so here's an array of 10 items. And if I want to see the string version of that, uh, the string version of that shows up here as 1, 2, 3, 4, dot, dot, dot. If I remove my module and I show that to string again, I get back system.object. Not so useful. It just shows me I have an array that's a collection. So I'm just being a little smarter. I'm looking at the fact that you're dealing with an array. I'm respecting the fact that there is an enumeration limit. If you look at a variable get, uh, oops, uh, one second. If you look at get variable format enumeration limit, the, the value is four. That this this two string method respects that, and it'll return to you a, a better glance of the constants of the array to the limit that's defined in format enumeration limit. Um, there's some other things here. So here I've got an array with a bunch of nulls, and uh, now uh, let me go back and make my log module loaded again because I loaded it. I can show the count. Uh, did that run? Yeah. One second. There. So there's five of those. Uh, there's five items, and I can compact that and remove all the nulls on it just by calling dot compact. That doesn't exist in regular PowerShell. I can take an array with a bunch of duplicate stuff and show only the unique things. I can take an array and I can reverse it. This kind of stuff. These things are not just in, they're just not in native PowerShell or .NET, and so I just added all these things because I wanted to have some useful utilities for things that I've run into over time that make sense. This is a two-dimensional array. I can flatten it and make it one-dimensional. I can take a one-dimensional array, and I can slice it into chunks and make it multi-dimensional, and then reference off that which particular chunk I want. So, so you can just do a lot of things to slice and dice arrays. Um, here's one of my favorite uh, additions in here, and this is the one, this is my, my driver for why I started creating this thing. I've got a number. It's 30. I want to know what 30 years looks like. There's 30 years, there's 30 months, 30 weeks, 30 days, 30 hours, 30 minutes, 30 seconds, 30 milliseconds. Or I can do it with a static number, but I have to put brackets around it because PowerShell doesn't allow me to do one dot year, which I wish it did, but it doesn't. Um, and so why is that useful? Well, you can do some things like this, 30.days.ago, and that gives me a date. And so, uh, or seven days from now, one week ago in UTC. And so it's, it's easier to read. So you compare something like, um, you compare something like uh, this, get event log, log name, system after, uh, and then I want to do get dash date dot add, uh, or days minus two because I want to get the, anything that came in the last two days. And so that works, but I find it quite ugly. And so, oh, and format PX might be playing around with something in the event log format. That might be a bug I've ever looked at. Yeah, I got something in format PX that's causing it to break out the tables because there are different types of information records in the log, so I'll, I'll have to fix that. Um, Anyway, um, so I can get the information, and I just find it's not as elegant. And so I much prefer this, the exact same command, but much easier to read. So get event log, log name system, after two dot days dot ago. It's, it just makes more sense to have that kind of access to this information. Um, similarly, sometimes you might want to do things a whole bunch of times. So I'm going to run here um, x equals 10, and I'll say hello 10 times. Um, and I, if I'm using PowerShell version 4, I don't need the brackets or 5. 
I don't need the brackets around the curly brace because they are smart enough to realize that when you have one parameter that takes a script block, that you can just pass the script block directly like that. Um, but PowerShell version 3 requires the brackets, and this is version 3 or later. So, um, so that, that's, that's useful and handy. Um, a bunch of things with collections. I'll just leave some of these things for you guys to, guys to go through. Like if you're going to do matching of any value in a particular collection, how many times you've run into that, right? You have a collection of objects, and you want to know if that collection contains any of a certain number of things. And you have to do some for each, and, and it's ugly, and so this kind of hides all that. So you know, just match any, like any, contains any, available on collections. Um, if you want to calculate sum, you can just do dot sum. Uh, and so that's useful for something like, uh, oh, you can pass it a property too, right? So here, um, I can get all my properties and calculate the sum of my working set uh, just by running uh, this command. Um, so that shows me how much memory my processes are using. Um, adding an item to a hash table uh, as a collection. That's tricky because the first time you add the item, you want to add it as an, an array of a single value, and then after that, you want to add it to the array. And so this just allows you to do that by calling dot add array item. It just figures the rest of that magic out for you and makes sure it's an array. If you're adding an array item, if it's not an array already, it'll add it and make it be an array. And then once you do that, it'll add it to that existing collection. So that's 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 handy. But just the normal add is just going to add it as if it's a static value for that, that particular uh, entry in the hash table. Um, you guys probably have seen this. Let's say I do uh, uh, $x equals gsp k star, $x dot for each, and I can then go $bar dot name, or I can do for each quote name. If you haven't seen this, this is very handy. This is something that was added with PowerShell version 4, for each. Um, as excuse me, an invocable method. It's a bit magical. You can't discover it. There's an article out there that I wrote on PowerShell Magazine that describes all the things that you can do with for each, as well as with where these two magical methods that exist. And they're in version 4 and 5, but they're not in version 3. But lots of people use version 3. And, and about version 3 is still my personal baseline for stuff that I write. So in type PX, I added these commands to version 3. So you get the same syntax. If, they're, if you're using version 4, it's not going to add them. You're just going to invoke the native stuff. If you're using version 3, it'll add these, these, these commands. So this for each and where and all this, all this magical syntax that works as a result. Um, you can do some fun things with strings. So I showed you the expand snippet uh, earlier. Um, expand string snippet. So here I got a value. It's a date. And now I've got a string that contains a placeholder for a variable I want to put in. But it's a single quoted string. And later on, I want to actually inject that. And so I can call dot .expand, and that'll do the injection at that point in time on that string. Um, so that's handy. Um, and in, in behind the scenes, that's actually invoking the snippet. Uh, comparing values against a collection. Yeah, so I've got a string hello, and I want to match any of a particular thing against that collection. This lets me do that. I can get the MD5 hash of a string. Um, uh, can, oh yeah, when you're working with secure strings, secure strings are interesting in PowerShell because they allow you to um, store strings so you can only can't see what the contents are, right? So I've got ss, it's a secure string, and I run ss, and there's my secure string. I can't see the contents normally, but people who know PowerShell know that you can do um, uh, dot, uh, what is it? Uh, come on, tell us work for me. Showing me my method. Secure string. I'm drawing a blank on the command I need to use to find the contents. Anyway, there's a way you can find contents off of the secure string, and this is again one of the reasons why um, there's, there's cases where you need to. You store a password, and then you want to invoke some command, and that command takes the password, but it takes the password in clear text because it's an old API. And so it doesn't take a secure string. But internally, it's still best practice to store it as a secure string. What if you want to, uh, oh, I know, I know what I was trying to get at before. I'll show that in a second. So I can do dot peak. And that shows me my string. So that's quite handy. So I'm, if I'm working with credential, right? Cred equals get credential and my username and my super secret password. Uh, so 
find my password. So there I go to my credential, and I don't see the password. It shows that it's a secure string. But I can do cred dot uh, get network credential, and then type that to format list star, and there I can see my password that I entered. So that's my super secret password, which actually has a typo. That's not what I intended to type in, but whatever. Um, well, I can also do cred dot uh, password dot peak, and I can look at it that way. So it's, it's just handy to be able to access these things this way, since you need to do it. It's not a security flaw. This is uh, uh, just something that's necessary sometimes when you're dealing with PowerShell. And so these are just format, or, or sorry, TechPX is designed to make a lot of those things easier. So that's what I've got for the main core of the modules I wanted to show. And I can tell I've been talking for an hour and a half, and my voice is getting a little hoarse, so I'll try to wrap it up. Um, just want to talk about a few other things that I'm working on. Uh, so other modules and future plans. So I've got um, already available today our SCS MPX, which is uh, System Center Service Manager PowerShell commands to make it a lot easier to work with Service Manager and PowerShell. Granted, I'm lacking some documentation on that. That's one of the first modules I wrote long ago, and I've got to circle back and do docs. All of these other ones I'm talking about are pretty good for docs right now. Um, um, but that one still, even with the docs, is quite useful if you're doing service, management, service manager automation. Um, if you're working with uh, SMA, service management automation, not meant to confuse you, it's not a play on words, that's the new Runbook engine in Orchestrator. It has PowerShell commands that are native to it. Those PowerShell commands have some design challenges, and there are some holes that are just waiting to be filled. So I've got a module out there that uh, addresses that. Then there's this mouthful, SCSM MPC PX. That stands for System Center Service Manager, Management Pack Configuration, and then my PX suffix. Um, if you're dealing with Service Manager, Service Manager is extensible, and you can create management packs for it. However, if you're going to create management packs for it, that means that you're going to involve using Visual Studio and or the um, uh, SCSM authoring tool, you're going to deal with creating XAML and XAML and C Sharp files and XML documents and compiling things and then creating your XML for your management pack, converting it to a .mp file when you add the uh, appropriate um, signed bits to it, and then create that, convert that into a bundle, MP, MPB file, and all of that's a heck of a lot of dev work that is very prone to human errors. And so I have this module that is designed to give you a vehicle to create PowerShell, to, to create management packs for Service Manager that whose core intent is basically just to do some workflow work under the covers, just to run some automation script, which is a, a heck of a lot of use cases. A lot of people want to extend Service Manager just by having it run something on a schedule. And the thing that they run oftentimes could be runnable by PowerShell. This makes that possible and makes it easy and it looks a lot like PowerShell desired state configuration. And it's dependent on this magical language PX module, which allows me to define domain-specific languages in PowerShell. Um, those are quite more complicated than what I've demonstrated today. Um, at least how they work is complicated, but actually defining management pack is easy. And so you can take a look at these. Um, these two are not available yet. Uh, I don't think I have language PX yet on PowerShell Gallery, but they are on GitHub. All of these four are on GitHub. If you're going to take a look at them, I recommend you get them from GitHub because one, well, I, I can't update SDSM PX on the PowerShell Gallery right now due to a bug. So the version on, uh, well, the limitation, I should say, in um, a limitation in the software that's used behind the scenes to store them in the gallery, and that limitation is being fixed, and once that's fixed, then I will update the gallery with my latest version of SCSM PX. But if you want the latest one in the meantime, go to GitHub. So those, I would recommend going to GitHub for any of these four to get the latest versions. Uh, the last th three, two to three, are in experimental state right now. Um, still fun and, and, and useful if you're working with Service Manager. Uh, Demo PX is one that I haven't even published yet. It's just on my radar. Um, you might have seen Start Demo Script. Uh, I'm basically creating a module on top of that uh, that just gives me some more advanced demo capabilities so that I can create YouTube videos of my PowerShell modules to show people these things more easily 
and, and, and in a more automated fashion because it's just time consuming to do so. Um, so that's something I'm working on. And if you look at, if I switch to my modules folder, uh, by the way, PS drives are awesome. I've got projects, I've got modules, I've got PowerShell, I've got uh, a bunch of different folders. I, I recommend using PS drives to set up where things are in your system because it just makes life so much easier. So I go to my personal modules folder and I will do GCI star PX. And here you'll see a lot of different things that I've got more than what I've shown you here. Um, uh, I'm working on something to do with prompts. I've got a profiler. Uh, this is actually interesting. Um, Test and command profiling that give you rich detailed information about the runtime of a particular uh, function script command so that you can figure out where performance uh, hits are. And I'm doing some stuff with Linux and Cygwin uh, to uh, basically I want to bring package management to Cygwin inside of PowerShell that leverages PowerShell Get and makes it so you can get get and manage segment packages that way. Um, so that's something I'm working on. I was tinkering around with some Git stuff because all of my stuff I do, I use source control because it's the best practice and you should. And so um, I've got some stuff I've been tinkering around with in Git and I mean to wrap that up in a module, but I haven't gotten there yet. And uh, yeah, so that, that's kind of a high level view of things I'm looking on, working on. Oh, and, and this one. Um, this is an important one. PS Script Analyzer is a module in PowerShell version 5 that is used to analyze uh, your own modules and your scripts and to look for common errors using global variables, using aliases instead of full command names, not using um, uh, command uh, parameters, named parameters properly, these kinds of things. Also more severe errors than that, and also lighter errors than that. So there's three categories. There's errors, there's information, and there's warnings. And that is used, it's called, it's, it's referred to in the developer community as a lint tool, and it just goes and finds things that you might have missed. And so there is a discussion about that being a front man to posting content in the PowerShell gallery. So it'll be run through this analyzer before it's allowed to be posted. And so that'll, if it finds anything that it considers to be serious enough, it'll say, well, you got to go fix this first. So it's important, but it's PowerShell version 5 only, which is annoying. But the PowerShell team, much like much of Microsoft, is really embracing the open source world and I love them for it. I'm very happy they're doing this. And so PS Script Analyzer is on GitHub. So last week, uh, I think it was last weekend, or no, before the tail end of last week. Anyway, I forked PS Script Analyzer on GitHub. I added code to it, made it work for PowerShell version 3, and I've got a version that runs on PowerShell version 3 that I build on GitHub. So, it, so that just brings it down level. They didn't have that planned. They didn't have that in their tool. I think it's important. The world works on PowerShell versions 3 and 4, sometimes even 2. I'm not going that far myself. Two's dead to me, but whatever. <laughs> um, this gives you PS Script Analyzer on PowerShell version 3. I haven't actually bundled up the module and published it yet because I'm working with the PS Script Analyzer team on how can we do that so that there is one module rather than two because I don't really want two. That's harder to maintain. Which one do you have? How do you upgrade? You don't want a version 5 version and a version 3 version. You just want one that works for both. I recently came up with an idea of how to do that. I just haven't implemented that piece yet. But if you want a version of PS Script Analyzer that works in the meantime, ping me. Let me know. You can reach me on, oh, by the way, I should have showed this stuff earlier too. Um, my Twitter handle is at Poshaholic, P-O-S-H-O-H-L-I-C. Uh, my emails are poshaholic at gmail.com. I also have at hotmail.com, but I check that one less frequently. So if you contact me one of these two ways, then and say, hey, could you send me your version of PS Script Analyzer that works with a version 3? I'd like to play with it. I'll be happy to do that. I've got it running on my local system. I'm just starting to go through my own modules with it, and it's a good tool, and you don't have to wait for version 5, and so you should start using it because it's, again, why not leverage these watchdogs, these tools that make your job easier. So that's something that I've, uh, I, I want to get to the point where it's published and just available through the gallery, but it's, I just need to go through and, and finish the work I started when I forked the code and started uh, building it. Whew. So, 
that's it. Ton of information, hour and 40 minutes. Um, I know it ran long. Uh, hopefully it was useful for those of you who dropped off of the call because of the hiccup. I apologize for that. There's a recording. Uh, if you have questions, I always tell people, they don't often take me up on it, but I always tell people when I do demos, if you have questions and you want to reach out to me, there's my email address. Feel free to use it. I've built up some great relationships with some people over the years, the people who actually have contacted me with questions, problems. It's helpful to me. You're not, you might think I'm busy and you're interrupting me. It's helpful to me to get questions about this stuff because it gives me feedback that then helps me put that back into the product and into these tools and give back again. And so it's a cycle that's important. So please don't hesitate. Reach out to me via Twitter or via email. Let me know how these things work for you. If you run into bugs, there are for sure going to be some. I've tested a ton of use cases, but as you saw here, for example, format PX right now, when I run it against uh, get event log output, uh, does some uh, weird injection of multiple tables that I'll, I'll have to go fix. So this is all an iterative process to make PowerShell better. And uh, I'm happy to do the work and I'm happier if others can contribute and help and uh, offer feedback and, and take it going forward. So that's it. That was a great presentation, Kirk. I really enjoyed that. And I've got I've got those five modules, uh, the main five, installed now. So I'm definitely going to be uh, using them. Yeah, I and, agree. Uh, Very good presentation. Thank you.